If I ask the question, what is the simplest subject in all of the Bible, what answer would come to your mind? What is the simplest subject in all the Bible? I think the answer has been revealed already in the scripture that was just read in our hearing, where Paul admonished that prayers and supplications, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness. And then he adds, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Therefore, that being the case, and certainly is, would it not follow logically that the simplest subject in all of the Bible would be how to be saved? If God wants all men to be saved, then why would he make his plan for saving man so convoluted or complex that man would have difficulty, if not the impossibility, of ever understanding it? And so it does follow that salvation is the simplest subject in all the Bible. But having said that, when we look around us and we see the diversity of plans, plural, that are given for salvation, everything from you need no plan at all to a plan that simply involves a prayer or one that involves more than simply praying a prayer. We see such a diversity and we see such a diversity of religious belief obviously evidenced by the proliferation of religious buildings that dot the landscape here in this community and in every community across the land. How can things be that simple if we are so divided? And especially on the subject of what one must do to be saved. This morning, I'd like for us to think about an illustration of the simplicity of salvation using something that all of us, hopefully, whoever drive a vehicle or sit in one, use on a regular basis. And that's this, a seatbelt. This seatbelt was actually in a General Motors vehicle, mark of excellence, it says. That could be debatable depending upon what you drive, I suppose. But according to GM, they are the mark of excellence. This came out of a vehicle which was obviously used by someone at some time or another. Many years ago, I was driving back into the state of Tennessee in the Memphis area when we were living there from the state of Mississippi after a teaching appointment one evening. And as I came up um, I-55, I believe it was, back into the state of Tennessee, I saw a sign as you entered the state. The sign is still used. That's been many, many years ago. And yet Tennessee is still using that same sign. You'll see it regularly. The sign simply said this, six words, Tennessee cares, buckle up, state law. And the sign is blue, as I recall, and uh, perhaps white lettering, and has a red seat belt as if coming together to illustrate the message that the state is trying to convey. And as preachers often do when they see something like that, I said, I, I think there's a sermon in that sign. And I got to thinking about how one could analogize those six words to something far more significant and far more important than the saving of our physical lives, and that is the saving of our souls. And so to me, spiritually, that would translate to God cares, buckle up to the blood of Jesus Christ, my law, the law. There are no other options. In other words, unless you contact the saving blood of Jesus Christ, there is no possibility of one's being saved. And I dare say that hopefully everyone who is here this morning, even everyone in that 
diverse religious community calling itself Christian would say absolutely that's correct. The blood of Jesus Christ is absolutely essential to our salvation. And without the blood of Christ, there can be no salvation. God cares. He cares supremely. He cares to an extent that it is difficult for the human mind to fully comprehend the depth of God's care and God's love for mankind. For God so loved the world. John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he has said, buckle up, as it were, become tied, come into contact with the blood of my son because there is no other substance that can take away sins. But the question is, how do we do that? There's the rub, as the expression goes. How does one contact that saving blood? No salvation without it, and yet the key question is, how does one contact it? Is it universalism? Universalism basically would say then that everybody's going to be saved, that there is nothing that one must do to contact the blood. In other words, the mere fact that the blood itself has been shed is sufficient because God did it all. God has done it all. There's nothing left for me to do except to simply wait for the salvation that will inevitably come because his blood was shed. Well, there's no doubt, as we've already pointed out, the blood had to be shed. Hebrews 9.22, the Hebrews writer reminds us that according to the law, almost all things are purged with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. An inspired writer has said there is no remission of sin. There is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of the blood of Christ. And the same writer in the same chapter a few verses earlier says, for if the blood of bulls and goats, referring to the old covenant, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot unto God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The blood of bulls and goats, the ashes of a heifer, all of those things under the old covenant simply pointed to the shedding of the blood of Christ that was absolutely essential for the absolute forgiveness of sins. Those animal sacrifices could not take away sin. Only the blood of Christ can take away sin. But is the mere fact that Christ has now gone to Calvary and has graciously and lovingly and sacrificially shed that blood, does that fact alone bring about our salvation? Well, if that were the case, to analogize the seatbelt, it would mean that simply because this seatbelt was once in an automobile, as your seat belts are in your automobile, that just the fact that they are there will save you in the event of an accident. You don't have to do anything else at all. The manufacturer has put it there, and all you have to do is wait for the accident to occur if it does, and that seat belt is going to save you. Who believes that? Well, of course not. This seat belt met federal standards. Your seat belt in your automobile has to meet federal standards. It's not made of scotch tape. It's not made of something that is going to break in the event of an accident, hopefully. It had to meet federal guidelines. The blood of Christ was the only thing that would meet God's guideline, as it were. It had to be shed, but the mere shedding of the blood in no way will save us. And I dare say that there's not a universalist here among us probably this morning. But what about this answer to how we've reached the blood? By faith alone. By faith alone. In other words, John 3.16, to which we referred a moment ago, would answer the question in the minds of faith-only advocates, sincere indeed in their belief about such. We do not question that. And here it is, they would say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, there it is, should not perish but have everlasting life. Is belief in John 3.16 faith alone? Well, if it is, where is repentance in John 3.16? 
every faith only advocate with whom I have ever been familiar would certainly acknowledge that a person has to repent but where is repentance in John 3.16? It's there. Where is it? In the word believe. In the word believe. Because believe there is obviously used in an inclusive or comprehensive sense as it is often used throughout Scripture. In other words, it is used to stand for and to include every other condition that is elsewhere stated in the New Testament that is essential to our salvation. That is not faith alone. Any more than I can be saved by my seatbelt by faith alone. Let me illustrate it. Let's say that I get into my automobile and Janice, my wife, is at my side and I do not immediately buckle up and she reminds me, Jim, buckle your seatbelt. And I say, Janice, I can't do that. And she would ask why, and I would explain, because I believe in it too much. And she would ask, you believe in it too much? I would say, yes, I believe in it too much. Do you not understand that I believe this seatbelt is going to save me, but if I, if I reach across and I pull it around me, do you not understand that I am trying to work out my salvation by works, and that I would be by so doing negating my faith in the seatbelt? Do you not understand that? And what might she say? Let me drive. <laughs> Seriously. Let me drive. Because we know that that is not logical. What we do know about the operation of the seatbelt is that in order for me to demonstrate my faith in the seatbelt, I must what? I must put it on. I must put it on. And by so doing, I am not denying my faith in it. I am showing how much I believe in the seatbelt. James 2, 19. James says, you believe there is one God, you do well. The demons also believe and tremble. In other words, to modernize James' words a little bit for us, he would say, you believe there's one God, well, that's all well and good, but it's not good enough. And let me tell you, the demons, when demon possession was a possibility, a reality in New Testament time, there were demons who believed in the same kind of belief that faith only represents. He has to be saying that. He has to be saying that. You believe there's one God? That's not good enough. Let me tell you who else has that same kind of faith, James says, the demons. And let me give you an illustration of where those demons demonstrated that faith. Matthew chapter 8, beginning at verse 28, when they came into the coast of the Gergesenes, there were two men possessed with demons, fierce, who came out of the tombs. They were exceedingly fierce. And when Jesus encountered them, they said to him, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Let me ask you, did those demons believe that Jesus was the Son of God? They expressed it. What have we to do with you, Jesus, you, Son of God? Did they believe he had the power to punish them? They did. Have you come here to punish us before the time? They knew who they were addressing. They believed him. Was their faith saving faith? Absolutely not. And that's the very thing that James reminds us of in that great treatise on faith in James chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. When he, in verse 19, says, you believe there's one God, well, that's all well and good in effect, but that kind of faith is the kind of faith the demons possess. And then he adds, but will you know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Then he uses the illustration of Abraham, justified by works. What kind of works? Works by which Abraham earned his salvation? No, that's an impossibility. But works by which he appropriated his salvation by a faith that demonstrated his 
love and trust and obedience. In other words, obedient faith. And then in verse 24, James says, You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith alone? Oh, James, brother, James, I wish we did in the world in which we live. Because for the most part, we do not. We do not. There's no other way to demonstrate your faith except through works. But the key is, whose works are they? God's works, not yours. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. And here the apostle Paul writes, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. What is faith? No, faith is not the gift of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Salvation is the gift of of God, but how is it appropriated? The same way the Israelites appropriated the city of Jericho when they marched around it in accordance with God's will. He said, I've given you Jericho, and then he told them what to do to take it. Was it still a gift? Absolutely, because they didn't do anything to earn it. Same principle is right here. By grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Boy, but somebody says, wait a minute here, look at the next phrase. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Not of works, and you're just contending that works will save? Yes, because I contend that different kinds of works are discussed in Scripture, some of which are approved, some of which are condemned. Works by which we could boast, mentioned in this context, will do no one any good. I can't devise a plan or a system of works by which I can save myself. That's an impossibility. But that's a far cry from saying there are no works that God has not set in motion that I must comply with in order to be saved. That's daylight and dark. And that's the main problem in the religious world today is the failure many times to distinguish between different kinds of works in Scripture. Martin Luther had a tremendous problem with it, didn't he? So much so that when, we, when he came to the epistle of James, he called it a right strawy epistle. In other words, it's just not worth the paper it's written on. Why? Because it countered his misconception about salvation by faith alone and thought he contradicted Paul in Romans. There's no contradiction whatsoever because the men are talking about two different kinds of works, one of which is approved, the other which is condemned. And Paul here... In verse 10, after saying in verse 9, or writing in verse 9, not of works lest any man should boast, he turns right around then and says in verse 10, for we are his workmanship, listen to it, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There are man's works, you can't be saved by those. There are God's works, you must be saved by those in combination with the grace of God. God's grace has given you the works of faith with which you must comply in order to accept his grace and to be saved. Grace coupled with God's works, belief, repentance, confession, baptism into Christ, so clearly taught throughout Scripture. We are his workmanship, Paul writes in that 10th verse. Created in Christ Jesus. When is one created in Christ Jesus? When he becomes a Christian. For what? Good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, there has to be a kind of work that is approved, and there is also a kind of work that is condemned. We must make that distinction. And so works of faith are absolutely essential. And that's what we see throughout the New Testament. You know, I used to have an automobile, a van, and on the driver's side, on the window, had a little sticker. And the sticker depicted a seat belt as if coming together. And then there was a little brief message under it, and it said, Together we can save lives. Together we can save lives. And it took me forever to figure out what the manufacturer was trying to say. Well, of course not. 
<laughs> I'm not terribly smart, but it didn't take me long to realize what he was saying, what the manufacturer of that vehicle was saying is, if you will work with us, we can save your life in the event of an accident. How am I supposed to work with the manufacturer? By putting on my seatbelt. God, our manufacturer, our creator, says to us, if you will work with me, we can save your soul. But I will not do it alone. And you cannot do it alone. But together we can save your soul. By my grace, which has given you the simple plan of salvation and your obedience to that simple plan, we can work together to save your immortal soul. And that's exactly what Scripture reinforces for us. Faith appropriates or accepts grace. How? By obedience. The blood of Christ, which is absolutely essential to our salvation, was shed in his death. John 19, 34. Soldier came after Christ had died, pierced his side, and there came out blood and water. The blood of Christ was shed in his death. The blood of Christ is contacted or reached in the likeness of his death. Very simply in a passage you have heard no doubt many times, Paul expresses it in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Or do you not know, writing to Christians now, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism <clears throat> into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we must, might also walk in newness of life. Listen to the same writer in Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27, when he says, for you're all sons of God. He's writing to Christians who had done it. He said, for you're all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were, what? Baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Let me ask you something. Where am I when I have put on my seatbelt? I'm in my seatbelt. But how did I get into my seatbelt? I had to put it on. It wouldn't do it itself. I had to put it on. And when I have put it on, I'm in it. Paul says so simply, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's no other way to put him on except in baptism. Why? Because the water saves us? Absolutely not. But because the blood saves us and God has chosen to place the blood of his son in the water. And by faith we go down into that water with faith in the operation of God to do exactly what he said he would do, and that is to remit or to forgive our sins. Listen to Colossians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Buried with him in baptism, Paul writes to these Christians who had done it. Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, that's their past situation, you what? He has made alive, listen to this, together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. That's perfect tense, having forgiven, looking back to the point in time in which those sins were forgiven. And when were those sins forgiven? You were what? You were raised with him. You were buried with him. And what does he say? He has made you alive together with him. Let me ask you, where was Christ when he was made alive from the dead physically? Still on the cross? No. He was not still on the cross. He was in the tomb. Paul says we're made alive together with him. Together with him means we're made alive in a tomb, the watery tomb of baptism where the blood of Christ is applied. He died, he was buried. We die to the desire to sin. We are buried in baptism where the blood cleanses us. We rise to walk in newness of life as he rose from the dead. There's the beautiful picture 
that tragically man has changed and altered so terribly by teaching a faith-only plan by which man is to be saved. And so the only way to buckle up to the blood, as it were, is by a faith, yes. Believe that I am he or die in your sins, Jesus said, John 8, 24, that leads you to repent, change your mind about where you are. Luke 13, 3, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish, Jesus said. To confess him to be the Christ, Matthew 10, 32, whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before the Father in heaven. But yes, baptism is absolutely essential because until we have gone through the watery tomb and been cleansed by the blood that is applied therein, there is no possibility of our being saved from sin. Jesus put it so simply when he said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Break it down very simply. He will be saved. That's the, that's the main part of the sentence, isn't it? He will be saved. Who is the he who will be saved in Jesus' statement? He who believes and, coordinating conjunction, is baptized will be saved. The he who will be saved is the he who will believe and act upon that faith, culminating in baptism for the remission of sins. And the Lord will add that penitent believer to the church for which he shed his precious blood. Now, this question. Once I've done that, how do I stay buckled? Tragically, there are many in the religious world today who contend that once you're buckled, you're always buckled. In other words, once you're saved, you're always saved. There's nothing you can do to alter that. That's just the way it is. And they might look at a passage like, and they do look at a passage like John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29, where Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Does that passage teach once buckled, always buckled? Does that passage teach that once you're saved, you're always saved? No. Listen to it. My sheep, what? Hear my voice. That's a condition. The sheep have to hear the voice of the, good, of the good shepherd. And then he says, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. They hear me, they follow me, and I give them eternal life. They don't hear me, they don't follow me, I don't give them eternal life. The reverse has to be completely true. But he says, but no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. That's exactly right. The devil cannot snatch you out of the hand of the Father. Freddie could come up here and he could make an effort to snatch me out of this seatbelt. And he'd have a hard time doing that. But I can easily remove it myself. And that's the point of John 10. Satan can never snatch you out of the Father's hand. You can, however, be seduced by Satan to leave the Father's hand. But he can't snatch you as long as you are what? Hearing and following. But when you cease to hear and you cease to follow, then Jesus ceases to bless as his follower. And there are some 2,000 passages in Scripture that teach the possibility of losing your soul once you have become a Christian. I'll cite just one of them, which is about as clear as you'd ever want it to be. Hebrews 3.12. The writer says, Take heed, listen to, brethren. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing or falling away from the living God. How much more would you need to know that a brother in Christ can depart from the living God, and yet there are hundreds of others. But you know, to analogize that contention that once you're saved, you're always saved, I could go back to the seatbelt illustration, and I could again be getting in my car, and Janice beside me says, buckle up, Jim. And I say to her, Janice, do you not remember that the first time I ever got in this car, I buckled my seatbelt, and do you not 
understand that once you're buckled, you're always buckled? What might she say? That's right, let me drive. <laughs> let me drive. Because she would understand that you need to continuously use the belt. We must continually use the blood of Jesus Christ. And John tells us how to do it in 1 John 1, 7 through 9. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses, keeps on cleansing us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. There's the plan by which the faithful child of God who will inevitably sin despite his best efforts keeps on being cleansed by the blood as he keeps on confessing and as he keeps up his walk in the light. Final question, when should I buckle up? When should I buckle up? Well, in reference to the seat belt, one might say, well, it's when I'm, it's when I'm driving over here on I-24 and I realize an 18-wheeler has just crossed the median and is going to hit me head on. It's time then to reach for my seat belt. No, it's too late then. It's too late. The time to reach for your seat belt is when you get in the car initially and hopefully before you ever start the engine put that seat belt on because we do not know what is coming and specifically when life will end for James describes it as a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away let me plead with you not to waste this opportunity to buckle up as it were to the blood of Christ in the only way that you can do so by believing in Jesus as the Christ, but acting upon that belief in repenting, confessing him to be the Christ, and being buried with him in baptism as we've outlined clearly from Scripture. Yes, the simplest subject in all the world, in all the Bible, is salvation. And why shouldn't it be? Since God's dream, if you will, is that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And maybe some here need to come back to that truth as one who's wandered away, who's lived in a way to bring reproach upon the blood-bought institution, the church. And if you need to repent publicly, we plead with you to do that with the full assurance that God will apply that blood again as you truly turn to it and turn from sin. And he will forgive and welcome you home with open arms, as will we as your brothers and sisters in Christ. As we stand together to sing, will you come? Today is the day of salvation and good.